I'd like to outline a simple strategy you can use to ace any exam that you might have coming up. Although the specific strategy is my own, the approach is based on cognitive science. In particular, I'm going to look at five key ideas from cognitive science that are easy to miss but are extremely important if you want to study effectively. So the first question to answer when you start planning your studying schedule is to ask yourself when you should study and how much. The obvious answer to this question is that you'll do better the more you study. If you spend 100 hours preparing, you'll do a lot better than if you spend 10, and you'll do even better than if you do nothing. This much is clear. But what's less clear is how you should allocate your limited studying time. And this brings us to our first cognitive science principle, spacing. The robust literature on the spacing effect clearly shows that studying time is more efficient if it is spread out over multiple sessions than if it is compressed into one session. More exposures to the information separated out in time will result in better attention than if you cram them together in one burst. Therefore, your studying schedule should take whatever time you have available and try to be as evenly spread as possible throughout your semester. It's natural to study a little bit more right before the exam, but you should do this much less than is typical. The next question to ask is how much to study each piece of information. I recommend that you aim for covering each piece of information via questions or problems five times, evenly spaced from the time you first encounter them until your eventual test. This approach is nearly optimal for retaining information with the least amount of effort. So once you've figured out your schedule, the second step is to look at what you're actually doing when you study. This is a place where there's a vast gulf between what most students think is effective and what actually works best. So consider one experiment by psychologists Jeffrey Karpicki and Janelle Blunt. In it, they had students in four groups, reviewing the information once, repeatedly reviewing the information, free recall, which means that you try to remember as much as you can without looking at the text, and creating a concept map, or also known as a mind map. So which did you think did best? Before I answer that, let me tell you what the subjects themselves thought. Those who did concept mapping and repeated review thought they understood it best, with those doing free recall expecting the worst grade. What really happened? The exact opposite. Free recall did much better than the other groups, even though the students themselves expected to score the lowest grades. This result is just one of many from a broad literature concerning the testing effect. This effect says that testing yourself, so that you have to retrieve the important information from memory, works much better than rereading notes or creating diagrams while referencing your textbook in terms of how you'll perform on the eventual exam. So the third step is to figure out what kind of practice to do. I like to think that there's a strict hierarchy of what kinds of study materials will be the most useful to you in preparing for your eventual exam. The most valuable are mock tests and exams which are intended to be identical in style and form to the test you're actually going to take. Next are problems given in homework assignments, textbook questions, or quizzes that are given for your class specifically. Finally, self-generated questions or writing prompts based on the material. Problem sets from other classes often differ a lot in scope and expectation, so I don't recommend using them if your goal is to study for a particular exam for a particular class. So the reason for this hierarchy of practice is known as transfer appropriate processing. This basically means that the more your practice resembles the exam, the more your practice efforts will transfer into actual results. If you don't have access to high quality problem sets, as is often the case in non-technical classes, a good solution is to do a writing prompt. So pick a concept, theme, or big idea and then try to ex explain it succinctly and accurately without opening the book. Then reread it to see if you got it right. Most academic classes are conceptual. This means that passing or failing inevitably rests on whether you understood some important ideas. Memorization matters, but it's more often as a means to understanding rather than an end in itself. This means that the fourth part of our strategy must be deeply understanding the core concepts behind any exam you're studying for. Practice problems already help with this, since to solve a problem you need to usually understand it. However, shallow understanding masquerading as deep one is a very common phenomenon. Psychologists even have a name for this, the illusion of explanatory depth. The reason is that while it's easy to self-check factual knowledge, you either know it or you don't, understanding proceeds in degrees, so it's easy to convince yourself you know what something when you really don't. As a result, I recommend the Feynman Technique as a tool for deepening your understanding of core concepts covered in a class. You'll know something best when you can teach it. For our fifth and final step, we need to go beyond just learning. Big exams come with big anxiety. Anxiety is a one-two punch for your studying ability. It's both harder to concentrate and the stress makes it harder to remember things even if you could. 
The solution is to make at least some of your studying sessions a full-blown simulation of the exam. If you have a few mock tests, I would save these for doing a full simulation of the test. Same seating posture, materials, and most importantly, the same time constraints. There's three benefits to doing full simulations like this. First, you increase your temporary anxiety while you're studying. This sounds like a bad thing, but what it does is it makes it easier to recall the information during the test because of state-dependent memory effects. Second, by exposing yourself to the exam situation, you'll be less anxious when the eventual test comes. Three, you'll actually know what your performance will be like on the test. Simulate your exams by doing mock exams and you can figure out how you'll eventually perform when the test finally comes. This lesson is just part of the ideas I teach in my full course, Rapid Learner. This is a six-week course designed to make you a more effective learner, whether that's for school, work, or life. Check out the link below to sign up to hear about our next session.